Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Melissa Addy. Hi Melissa. Hello Joanna. It's great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Melissa writes historical fiction, non-fiction and magazine articles. She had a, has a master's degree in innovation and has worked in product and packaging development as well as business mentoring. In 2016, she has been working as Leverhulme's Trust's writer in residence at the British Library based in the Business and Intellectual Property Centre. And her latest book is Merchandise for Authors, Engage Your Readers While in increasing your income which all of which I had to put everything in the introduction because it's so interesting <laughs> so Melissa why don't you um why don't you start by telling us a bit more about your background and how story and business have intersected in your own history and how you got into writing Okay, so I spent about 15 years in the business world, mostly for retailers, so Sainsbury's and M&S and people like that. Um, first doing a lot of product innovation and packaging. Uh, design and development and then after that I was mentoring entrepreneurs for a number of years um, and that was a really fun job because I just met all these entrepreneurs and they'd tell me their story and I'd try and find ways of helping them and we had a grant giving program that we were doing at the time and I think that sort of rubbed off eventually because when I started doing more and more of my own writing um, I suddenly thought well yeah let's go let's go indie let's do it my way because I got I think it just rubbed off on me the way that they thought about things and the way that they treated their work as a business um, and I thought that was a really interesting way of doing things and at the point just at the point where I managed to go full time two small children so it's not very full time um, but at the point where I managed to do that with the writing um, I got the chance to be at the uh, British Library, which was amazing. It's been the most brilliant year. Um, but with them, it was great because they have the Business and IP Centre. We did this bid which talked about the twin themes of storytelling for business and business for storytellers. So it was looking at writers being much more uh, entrepreneurial and business-like about their work and looking at businesses trying to be more creative and trying to find a way to tell their stories better. So that was brilliant for me because at the point where I was moving from the business to the writing, I had a chance to bring the two things together and work with other people on it and, and run workshops and think through my ideas. Um, and so on the on the storytelling side for the businesses, we came up with the storytelling entrepreneur, which is about how they can tell their, their stories better. But on the authorial side, we came up with um, uh, the, the book about merchandise because I felt how come all these uh, writers aren't creating their own products, aren't doing their own merchandise when for indie filmmakers and for uh, indie bands, that's a big thing. That's something they do. So how come the writers aren't doing it? And if you go and look at literary merchandise somewhere, for example, like Etsy, you'll see a ton of the stuff. It's mostly for, for old dead writers <laughs> because they're out of copyright. So everyone can make money from their work. So that's fair enough. But it, it shows that there's a demand out there. It shows the that people who love books also like having the products that go with those books. Um, and so I, I thought, okay, let's find a way of making that merchandise development um, interesting and, and easier for, for writers who might be new to it. So you started to talk there a bit about why authors should consider merchandise. You, you mentioned that there is a demand and that's totally true. Like you, you see, um, I bought my husband some cufflinks made from the text of Lord of the Rings, which, yeah. you know, which actually probably is not allowed well you know lord of the rings is still i think in copyright but um the you know they were using the kind of cast off pages from books yes. so that's probably on the line of being acceptable but um it sort of give us some other reasons why authors should consider merchandise in the first place like what are the benefits yeah so i i sort of in my mind i have a list of five things that it should be doing for you the, the number one thing is it should bring in some income because all writers appreciate income and um so that's a it's a good way of starting off to think it could bring in some income that means that you need to check it's going to be profitable so there is no point at all in you creating all kinds of fantastic products and merchandise that aren't profitable because in that case they're just gifts which is lovely but you can't just be handing out gifts to everybody <laughs> interminably that's not very good business so that's one item um, they need to add to your credibility. So they need to either draw your readers further into your world. So that's about enhancing the reader experience. Or, for example, if you teach creative writing, you might have something like a creative writing prompt or a book about it or something like that. So it's it's enhancing your credibility. Um, 
it can increase your readership because if someone comes across the product before they come across your books, they're going to think, wow, this is a fantastic product. So, so where is this coming from? Where are the books? And so then they're going to go and find your book. So that's a way of increasing your readership. And it can increase your visibility because it doesn't really matter if the person buying your product doesn't like necessarily your genre, for example, because they become aware of you. And that means they can spread the word about you because you don't know who they know who will say, oh, but I really love such and such a genre. And they'll go, oh, I know. I know this writer because I've got some of their items. Um, so that's a, a way of thinking about is a piece of merchandise worth investing the time in? If it can do some and preferably all of those things, then you're on to a winner. Yeah, and that's great. And um, I know people listening are going, ah, but I'm not a designer and how do I make stuff? We're going to come to those things, people listening. So don't worry about that. We're just we're just pr proceeding slowly. So the first, the, the next question would be, you mentioned there, check that it will be profitable. So, you know, in the, in the romance author space right now, a lot of romance authors do a lot of what you were mentioning there would be more like gifts. Like they're doing merchandise that are based on their books, but it's more of a fan giveaway type thing. So, What's is that the difference between merchandise and a product, or, or what? How are you defining merchandise and products? Okay, so merchandise and products. Um, I'm going to take the Harry Potter books because it just makes it very easy to explain. If you create a wand product, that's a piece of merchandise because it belongs to the Harry Potter world and it draws you, the reader, deeper into that world. If, on the other hand, uh, J.K. Rowling was to bring out a range of notepads that's relevant to her as a writer but it's not actually anything to do with the harry potter world so it's just a product and that's fine because some people have products rather than merchandise but that's the difference between the two people talk interchangeably about them as well and i do it as well but it's just worth bearing in mind what is it you want the item to do is it just a nice product that you're going to sell that has some relevance to you generally as a writer or is it a piece of merchandise in which case it needs to enhance the reader's feeling and and connection to the world that you've created oh that's really that's really interesting so what uh what would those cufflinks be then with the um with the text of tolkien well i would say that that was leading you into the world because it's reminding you when you're looking at that it's reminding you something of that um it's reminding you that that is what the, the you know the text that you've enjoyed that that brings you back to it. So um, Haruki Murakami has a, a diary app and that's got a little, it's, it's basically just a simple calendar app, but what it has in there is little references to his books, little quotes from them. He's even got some um, exclusive stories. So again, that's pulling you back to him, to his text, to his world that he's created. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Okay, so you've given us a few examples there. The wand, the notebook, the app. Um, and again, people are starting to think, oh my goodness, you know, th that might be too expensive. And on the other end of the scale, one thing that I think is kind of pointless is so many authors seem to spend money on bookmarks, which, you know, I see, I think are sort of the, the mo probably the cheapest thing you can do, but possibly the most useless. <laughs> so what, what, are some, <laughs> what are some other like examples of merchandise that, that wouldn't break the bank and, and maybe some other like really cool examples okay so the, the the best one i've come across so far which i just thought was wonderful is actually in the book and it's a woman called Catherine j martin she's an author and a speaker in america and she does a lot of of, of talking and when she does she has this poem that she wrote and it's about kind of time passing by and families coming and going and all sorts of things a whole sort of reflection on life generally and um, she, all she does is she has this copied onto really nice quality paper and she has it available when she speaks and she says it's available for a donation you know one dollar three dollars that kind of thing and almost everybody always gets it and sometimes they get multiple copies of it and they frame it and they give it to friends and it's just because it's a very heartfelt piece and it goes with what she's talking about now you think that is pence to make that item and yet people are happy to buy it for a couple of dollars and she is you know that has gone for years and years and years and years this poem and it's doing wonderfully well for her and it just ties in very well to who she is and what she's talking about so i think that is my favorite example of something that just costs practically nothing and is doing very well 
decade after decade. So that's that one. Um, in terms of crazy expensive but pretty amazing stuff, I did just see that you can buy the throne from Game of Thrones. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> it, it weighs 159 kilos. That's like 300 plus pounds. Um, it costs 20,000 pounds and it takes eight weeks uh, delivery because they've got to make it for you. Um, but, you know, if, if, if that's your big thing, then go for it. Um, but I did find that one quite amusing. Really. Wow. Do you know what? If It can't be the throne for 20 grand <laughs> because I'm already thinking that would be really cool. I think it, they must be replicas. You know, like they do replica of the one. Like my husband. Ha- yeah, it has to be a replica. My, do- my husband does have a one ring in, in New Zealand, but like all these shops selling the one ring. It's like it's not the one ring. There are lots of them. <laughs> But um, I think with the Game of Thrones, you don't you don't even have to fight or anything for it. You just you, you just, just get it. <laughs> but but that's really interesting because you know I'm not going to spend twenty grand on the on that throne. But I bet I bet you they sell thousands of them. Like I can. I, I bet there are some people out there. Yeah, I think there would be people really up for that. And um, <laughs> but what's interesting, the poem is really interesting because so many times I've said on this show, um, you know, p- poets write for love, not money. What you've just given there is an example of a poet, or, or you know, she does other things. Yeah. She's not directly only doing poetry, but but using a poem in some kind of merchandise is brilliant. But, and actually, it's how people feel, right? So what she's doing is you you felt something about this poem, so now you want to take it away with you. And I think creating merchandise around emotional aspects of your work is probably the way forward. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I think I think if you want to find merchandise within your own books. Um, thinking about the feeling that you want to evoke is a very good way to start, especially for nonfiction. For nonfiction, it works really well to think, what is the feeling that people are buying this book for? You know, is it, are they trying to help themselves be a better something or another, you know, parent, lover, whatever? Um, are they trying to, you know, feel better about themselves? Are they trying to feel better about the world? You know, whatever it is, the feelings are very important, especially for a, for a nonfiction. And then I think for fiction, that can be important as well, that feeling perhaps of being swept away into a new world or something. Um, and also thinking about those senses and going through your work and thinking to yourself, what are, for each of my senses, what could draw me into the world that I've created? So, you know, is it something you could eat? Is it something you would look at? Is it some sort of texture, the sounds, the smells, those sorts of things? Yeah, that's that's super cool. And I mean, I think uh, it, we we kind of use up a lot of our imagination on the on the book itself. And you know, you 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 asked at the beginning, sort of, why aren't more authors doing this stuff? And I think it's almost that we assume that the words are the product, like are the end of the product. And also, I think we don't necessarily know what people might buy. Um, so you you know, you interviewed a lot of people for the book. And I imagine that some of the mistakes were not checking that people might actually buy this stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. What, what are some of the mistakes that people have made with merchandise? Yeah. So a couple of mistakes. Um, what, I mean, just generally not being profitable. That is that is a mistake just straight from the start. Um, one uh, lovely author, she, she did a really nice little kind of, um, you know, like a postcard with a little image thing and a map and all sorts of really cute. But she didn't package it as for sale. And so people kind of came to events that she did and then just went, oh, that's nice. I'll just take that home then. And she's going, ah, uh, uh, actually, no. And so that was a, just a tiny mistake. But what she did then was find nice little, um, you know, like, like plastic bags that you could put it into, like a little slip cover and put the price on it. And then immediately that becomes a product for sale rather than people just thinking it's something they can just take. Um, so that was a, a, an error not to make. And um, another one that I liked was... Um, an author who did a beautiful colouring book, an adult colouring book based on um, his take on Alice in Wonderland, which was kind of a game book with choices and things. Um, and he, the, the colouring book is beautiful, but the drawings were taken directly from the book and they were too shaded in. So they, there wasn't enough space for you to do your colouring, really. It was too dark. Um, however, that book sold so incredibly well for him so he's definitely doing more of them but he's going to have two sets of drawings done one that's not shaded in and one that is 
Yeah, that's great. And you mentioned their set of drawings done. And this is the point, um, because I know people are sitting there going, but I'm a writer. I don't do design work. So how can people um, find a designer? Like, what is the best way to do that before we get to the kind of the, the websites you can get stuff made? Sure. Um, so, well, some some writers do also illustrate, and I think they are just they've just got their merchandise kind of on a silver platter for them, so they they're good. Um, but for the rest of us that can't even draw sick people, um, you can do things like, uh, for example, go on Fiverr and find people who are designers, illustrators. So there's a guy who does writing maps. He's called Sean Levin, and he does beautiful maps that open up, and they've got all different writing prompts for for creative writers. And um, he uses different designers each time, and he often gets them from and he'll look and see what kind of work have they done already does it fit with his image of what those maps should contain um so that can be that can be a really good way forward um obviously ask other people if you see someone who's had a really nice piece of um, illustration done for them, then that's a, a good way to get somebody that's recommended. Um, but that can be a way of, of finding illustrations or find an illustrator as well um, whose work you've seen in books and contact them and see if they'd like to do work together. Yeah, and um, I'll mention a previous sponsor of the show, 99designs.com forward slash Joanna. Um, yeah. Nine, yeah, 99designs do a lot of this merchandise stuff design or graphic designers in general. So there are lots of graphic designers um, who are now doing book cover design who yeah. are originally you know kind of um, graphic designers and this is this is definitely an area that i would see many of those designers getting into um over time yes so yes. let's also just talk about um uh, briefly about ip rights to the copyright of images so how can people be sure that they are um using images like and let and let Obviously, if you commission something, then you're getting something original. But what should people watch out for when using images on merchandise? Okay, so first of all, you need to make sure that, for example, if you've used an image from an image bank, you need to check under what conditions did you did you get agreement to use that. Um, and quite often, some images can be licensed, for example, for your website just to illustrate something nice, but they don't actually want you to use it in a commercial way in terms of selling that image on. Um, so that's something that you always need to check. They do obviously have licenses as well for using it commercially. So it's just being just checking if you buy it from an image bank which license you've bought it under um, and certainly if you're commissioning someone making sure that those rights are coming to you and that you're able to carry on using them so it's it, that's worth checking yeah exactly and and we as writers who make money from our copyright from our intellectual property rights it's so important that we get this image stuff correct um so i really urge people to look at your license so for example i use big stock photo to get um, images for the website but I know like you mentioned they have a license on them also sometimes the images we get for our book covers might only be licensed for say um, 100,000 copies and that that might sound a lot <laughs> but <laughs> but you never know if something takes off um, like I was talking with my designer we use one of the images we use on a number of books is a, a couple running um, and we use that on a number of books so obviously if you use the same image on a number of books you know you're gonna you're gonna sell more and then at some point we were like oh we might actually need to buy another <laughs> license for that image <laughs> yes you might run out a lot quicker than you were expecting to exactly so I really want people to note this as a very important fact for your website and and also like another sort of um a little story a friend of mine recently had a guest post from somebody on her website and the person you know submitted an image with their guest post and then um you know that she assumed had been checked for the royalty free and then she got a um, invoice from getty images for like a thousand dollars because you know this this person had just taken an image off the internet and getty as you know but people listening is the most expensive <laughs> Oh, image no. licensor out there so oh, no. yeah this yeah. is a big you, you do deal. need to be careful about this kind yeah. of thing you need to know where an image comes from and who's got the who's got the rights to it 
Yeah. Okay. So um, just something really simple like um, a mug. So um, I just recently did one on society6.com, which I haven't actually really talked about very much or tried to sell. <laughs> it has sold a couple of copies. Um, but what are your, and Julie Huss, who's been on the show, recommended society6.com. Um, yeah. But what are the best places for doing this kind of print on demand merchandise, which will cost a lot less than getting stuff made? Yes, I think I think just as we've had the print on demand with books, so people who are used to that will understand the concept that now you can have that on products. Um, I mean, in the book, I just talk about um, Zazzle and Cafe Press as two of the possible places, just because they have a lot of products available that you can have brand. I mean, they've got guitar picks all the way through to kitchen clocks, so they have a really, really wide range of things. Um, and it's very straightforward and very simple to understand how it works, and you have your own kind of little shop within their shop, um, which obviously you can link to from your website so that's a, a nice straightforward simple one there are then also tons and tons of websites who do more um more niche products or they've got particular areas that they're interested in so there's a lovely one called spoon flower um and they do fabric. So you can design your own fabric. You can design um, little kits for people to go and make like a pair of pajamas or a bag. Um, and they will send out all the all the stuff that goes with it. So the fabric and the, and the instructions and all the rest of it. Um, so there are places that, that specialize in particular things. There's even a place, I like their name. That's why I like talking about them, called Harvey Maria. And they do vinyl flooring. And you can have any image you want put onto a vinyl vinyl floor and then they'll just send it to you ready ready for your bathroom floor whatever so I've got a lily pad on my floor but you could have the cover of your book if you were very <laughs> egocentric um, or you know something relevant to your books which might be fun yeah and I think well the point there is that um, it, there are more and more options for this type of print on demand and like I've had um, uh, Ke uh, Kevin on to talk about 3D printing and um, you know he was mentioning you know now that you don't necessarily need a you don't have a 3D printer in your house you just upload the the pattern um, to I can't remember the website name but then they print it and it arrives in the post so I know it's amazing it is so this is the thing I mean, and it's funny. And again, people are like, "What? Well, why is why is Joanna Penn talking about physical products? Because <laughs> I've been so digital for years. Um, but it is, I think it's really interesting. Now, let's just take it further. So obviously, with print on demand, as we know, with with print books, um, you get lower profit. I mean, you don't have to pay up front, but your profit is lower. So what if um, somebody goes, look, I know that I can sell um, a thousand, you know, 2000 mugs because I'm going to do this particular event or I'm going to give them away in or in my ticket price for an event or something. So I want yeah. 2000 mugs done. So w where are the places to look if people actually want to do this kind of short production run? So if you were looking at, at doing something more like that, then that would be the moment to go and find a place that is actually much more um, specific um, to whatever it is that you want to have made. So um, I know that you you were asking me earlier about journals and about how you could have a, a really beautiful journal made, for example. Um, and there's actually a website um, called brandbook.de uh, forward slash N. Um, and they are absolutely beautiful journals and you can have it customized however you want. Um, and the, the sort of basic ones start about 14 euros, which isn't that bad. And you buy 25 of them as a minimum, but they are, they will do you know uh, you have to have multiple copies not just one at a time um but they do start at just 25 of them um or you can customize them beyond belief i had quite fun adding you know gold to everything and all the end papers were in scarlet and i had all sorts of fancy bits to it and the more more fancy bits you add to it the more they then go okay you need to contact us for a bespoke quote but the thing about that is that if you can find somewhere that really specializes in something uh then they will be able to do you a much more interesting job of it and also larger quantities for a better deal. No, that, that is awesome. And, uh, you know, for people listening, I am definitely, well, I say I'm definitely, I am really hardcore considering doing a premium notebook in 2017, like in time for the Christmas season, because, uh, you know, I use notebooks all the time. And um, a couple of other people I know have come out with these uh, custom notebooks this year. Um, and as I mentioned before, sort of workbooks are um, an obvious thing to do with your print on demand nonfiction. Um, but yeah, I think like custom notebooks, 
books for writers is a, a really good place to start. And I mean, a lot of people are interested in T-shirts. Uh, do you have specific uh, sort of ideas on T-shirts? I think with t-shirts, um, the, the more fun things that I've seen done are there's a big trend at the moment for having like vast quantities of text on it. So it's like practically the whole book on one t-shirt and they, they look amazing. <laughs> um, and I've seen a fantastic girl on Etsy uh, called Ruby and she does um, skirts that have got, it's kind of black at the top, but then the, the bottom part has pieces from Hamlet or pieces from Pride and Prejudice or whatever. And I just think that would look really cool to have you know your actual text from the book um onto pieces of fabric rather than trying to find a special quote from it or something just having lots of the text because it looks very graphic very it really draws the eye mm. um i think the site's called teespring the print on demand uh t-shirt would that okay, be right specifically for t-shirts specifically for t-shirts yes but i mean almost all the sites that do products uh printed on demand will do t-shirts yeah the only thing i would say on that um is like years ago i did do something through zazzle for a t-shirt and the quality just wasn't there so one really important point i think if you're going to do merchandise is create one and then buy one yourself like definitely be before you tell anyone you've got to get one so i've got <laughs> i've got here on my desk i've got my creative um, creative mug which is quite cool <laughs> um, but at the moment yeah there's, there's very few of them uh, which is which is awesome okay so the other thing um is uh, what I wanted to talk to you about was was contracts and um, intellectual property rights since you've been at the British Library yeah. which you know we're <laughs> going to be talking about much more on the show in 2017 but um one, uh, I have two examples of interesting people. So one is David Morell of uh, First Blood or Rambo fame, who came on the podcast and talked about um, a very important clause that made uh, made sure he has been getting a percentage of merchandise associated with Rambo uh, since yeah since the 1970s. And they're about to bring out young Rambo. They're about to start using his stuff all over again. And so David is smiling all the way to the bank. Meanwhile, I saw um, just this weekend Carrie Fisher from Star Wars um, signed away the rights to her image when she was 19 doing the first Star Wars movie oh. and she, <laughs> she has not she has not had any money from her image so presumably all those action figures and oh just so much that was done wrong there so um, w what other sort of horror stories or good stories have you heard about this sort of um, clauses and what should people watch out for? So first of all, um, if you're being published by a, a, a traditional publisher, you need to look at the contract and see what's happening with the merchandising because sometimes it's it's excluded so it's not in there at all so then it's yours to keep if it is included in there you do need to make sure you're getting a percentage of it if it's been included but your publisher hasn't done anything with it for quite some time it's worth contacting them to see if you can get it back because if they're not doing anything with it and you're going to create something interesting that might push the book that should be really in, in their interests as well so it's worth even if they've been signed away without you realizing it's worth going back and just checking well what have they done with it and could you possibly get them back so that's something worth checking i think yeah definitely and if you are going to sign a contract with a publisher i mean I think it would depend, right? I mean, like I've got an idea right now from a whole nother series. I think mainly because of this Fantastic Beast stuff that's been happening, yeah. with that, you know. Th and this is a great example again, isn't it? Because um, it was a throwaway kind of comment in one of the books that there was a, te yeah. a textbook um, yeah. that this guy had written. And now they've made this whole new franchise out of a textbook mentioned in the book. Um, I know, it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. And um, so it... it I guess the question will be like, what type of publisher are you signing with? If you're signing with a small boutique press, it's very unlikely they're going to have the size and scale to actually merchandise your book. Like, for example, I would love my Arcane series to be, uh, you know, in gaming because it's very, yeah. you know, fighting and leveling and, and sort of missions and stuff. Um, but a small press is never going to do that. So you know, should should authors consider the, you know, what, what the publisher's doing with merchandising with other books if they're going to sign with someone? Yes, definitely. Just just have a look. What do they already do? Ask them what do they already do? And if they're wanting your merchandise, right, you need to ask them, well, what are you going to be doing with it? And is that something 
that you feel has got legs that you're happy with um, and that you want a cut off because otherwise you're going to be cut out of it um, and you don't know how much that might take off and also look at you know what kind of contacts do they have and, and what sort of skills do they have for taking it forward it's no good them buying the merchandise rights and then they don't actually ever do anything with them that's that's kind of pointless because you can't benefit um, and they're not going to do anything with it so that that would be a mistake I think yeah and also i think you know in the same way we've seen in the indie community we've seen the rise of, of freelancers um you know freelance cover design freelance editing is the kind of basic level but now there's lots of service companies helping people publish i think freelance merchandising uh i don't know what you would call it like a consultant or a like this guy yep. sean levin you mentioned um i went on his website after i read your book and you know he does take pictures and basically he acts more like a project manager doesn't he for sort yep. of organizing merchandise and i think that's a real gap in the market like i would love to sit down with someone and say here's my ideas and they're like oh well we could do this and you know this and that and the other and, and they'd know all the right site so is there such a thing as a merchandise project manager <laughs> <laughs> not that i've seen yet um but i think it would be an interesting interesting thing to get into i mean i think what you want is someone that's got a lot of contacts with with the illustrators with the providers who, who actually you know the manufacturers um and who can bring that together in a way that works for each writer what i don't really like is very sort of bland let's all do a bookmark let's all do you know something that isn't very interesting and then it, and then it's just you know your name on it or something and it doesn't really pull you into the world or really add to the interest around that author and that's why i think it's interesting to go more bespoke with items so one of the things that i talk about is if you can have um, experience vouchers, for example, that would be an amazing thing because let's say that your your main character shoots guns a lot. You can have someone go to a firing range and actually try what it's like to shoot a gun. Or, you know, if somebody goes hot air ballooning, take them on a hot air balloon ride. And the, the link that that will bring to your world and their connection to your character is so strong. And I think that could be a really interesting way to go. And all you need to do in that case is you don't have to set up your own shooting range you need to find um, a company that does experience days and build in some kind of affiliate commission with them so you say okay i'm going to direct people towards your site because i want them to buy these really interesting vouchers that you do for experiences because they're relevant to my books what can we do in terms of a deal can you give my readers a discount can you give me an affiliate commission and i think that could be a really interesting way to go a much more bespoke to a writer yeah. Oh, I like that idea. This is the thing when you actually start kind of brainstorming options. There's there's so much, isn't there? You know, so there is. There's lots of ideas. I think if if you sit there and think about what what recreates your world, and just and just go wild with your imagination, then actually there's some really cool stuff out there. Yeah, uh, there is absolutely. And um, just one uh, another thing on on the kind of merchandising rights, and I'm including gaming in this, which may actually be a derivative right. Yeah. Um, and I'm still getting into this IP right world. <laughs> Um, but um, I recently uh, got an email asking to have one of my characters in a game. Now, this was a board game, so that might count more as merchandise as opposed to, you know, like a, um, a digital game. Um, okay. So they said, can we have one character? And, you know, even just a few months ago, I would have jumped at it. I would have gone, oh, that sounds awesome. Let's do it. Um, but yeah. then because of what I've been learning, I learned that this entanglement like if I licensed one character to this company it might entangle the rights to the rest of the whole world because he was a recurring yep. secondary character so so I basically said no so do you think I did the right thing <laughs> um I think I think what you know what you did was right in terms of you went and found out what is appropriate to that industry and if there's an issue for them around in that particular gaming industry around they want everything or nothing then that's a good reason to stay clear of it if perhaps you could have said okay um, I'm classifying that as merchandise not as as gaming rights and I want a very dis you know maybe a way of, of, of creating a contract that was very uh 
restrictive, if you like, where they go, okay, you only have the rights to do this with them, not to do anything else with them. It could be a way of testing it to say then to go to the gaming industry and go, you know what, we've tried it on a board game and people love this character. They love the world. They love the idea of it. How about we do the whole world as a game in terms of, you know, as a, a, a gaming game rather than a board game? Um, so that might be a way of testing it. But you do have to be very careful, as you said, that it doesn't do something that upsets that particular industry where they would then go, no, that's not acceptable within our industry. So it's always worth checking how it works in a specific industry. Yeah, I think that is awesome. And, and it's so funny because the more I learn about this IP stuff, the intellectual property stuff, the more I think I need to wait. The longer I wait to sign anything, the more knowledge I can gain about these things. And one of the other, it, you know, th there's a difference between the do-it-yourself merchandising, like we've been talking about, or yeah. trying to license your world to other companies who might be able to package this stuff. Um, so, like, for, you know, J.K. Rowling, there's no, you know, she has a company, Pottermore, but there's no way this film and all the merchandise associated with the film are done by Pottermore. So she would yeah. license license that to companies that could do that and I think for indies we you know this is where we can start thinking about making things a lot bigger you know and um I was thinking about this like you come from a you know packaging originally we have to package our world in the way that these that makes these companies lives easier so if you yes. can if you can present it in a way that they go oh wow that's amazing then they're more likely to buy the rights so is that the type of thing you've seen and do you have any recommendations for for kind of packaging your world I think um in terms of what you're doing, for example, I think having a, an ongoing series is a really useful thing because that shows that there isn't, it's not just they've only got scope for this one book and that's it. And then there isn't really much more of a story to tell. If you've got an ongoing series, then that gives other people the opportunity to think, well, OK, so that can that can build into different things. It can go on a longer story. I mean, you know, all, all of the J.K. Rowling um, items they've all done long long books so there's seven in the Harry Potter which got turned into eight films and there's a coming five just from as you said just from a textbook they're going to have five films so um being able to see that there's that long running element to your world that you've created, I think is probably a really nice part of the package. But I think being able to show that you've done some merchandising initially yourself and that there's scope for it is a nice way to, to show the the possibilities behind it and even things that you've turned down. You know, the fact that someone's come to you and said, can we do this with your um, character shows that there's beginning to be a demand for it and an interest in it. So even the opportunities that you turn down in a way help to package your world because they help when you go to make that big pitch or that someone comes to you to talk about it. it that is part of your packaging is the things that you've turned down as well as the things that you've proven work. Um, and also being able to have characters who um, not not too restricted in how many characters there are, but that they've got a group around them of secondary characters who are who give more scope for more merchandise, for more ideas. You know, the Star Wars uh, franchise helps partly because there's an awful lot of different figurines you can make. There's not just kind of two main people. There's loads of things that you can make um, into merchandise. Mm. Oh, this is brilliant. I I want to do more on this in 2017. This is an area I'm so interested in. And and also just coming back to Carrie Fisher and Star Wars, you know, she signed that contract assuming that that would be nothing, that that film would be a throwaway film that, would yeah. that wouldn't go anywhere. So she signed a contract just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And what authors i want authors to remember this example because your your rights are or can be incredibly valuable you know i mean david morell is you know with first blood as well when he invented john rambo he i think it's john i don't know i haven't read the book <laughs> but you know that that um you know that character has become quite iconic and you know when i interviewed david he was like yeah you, you just don't know what what is going you know what what 40 years later what's still going to resonate yeah that's amazing the, the longevity of that 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 builds over time even so that's quite interesting isn't it because even star wars they did diversity films and you might have thought well that was it 
but now there's just 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 more and more and more Star Wars um, works being made, um, and there is a problem, of course, with somebody. I mean, partly at the time, I don't think people realised the sort of scope of what might happen um, to a film. So it's only examples like that that have made everybody else sit up and go, "Oh, think a bit more carefully before you sign the contracts." Yeah, exactly. Wow. So where can people find you and your books online? So I'm on melissaaddy.com and uh, my books are mostly on Amazon. I do have an audio book because it was uh, a book about um, 100 things to do while breastfeeding. So that was a, a better for audio because it worked for um, breastfeeding mothers. Um, but generally I'm online and come and have a look at the website. Come have a chat. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Melissa. That was great. Thank you, Joanna.